Hey, so we're in our new series called DNA, and I pray that you were encouraged last Sundays. We kicked off week number one. If you want to go back to our YouTube channel, Hope City, we have all of our archive messages. Kicking off this year, we kicked off with a series called The Reset. Month number two, we talked about the evidence that if you walk with the Lord, there should be some sort of evidence. And then for week number, or for uh, month number three, right now, we're in the DNA series. Last week, a little recap, I preached a sermon, I felt boldness on it, I preached a sermon last week called There's a War for Your Worship. How many of y'all got something out of last week? Come on, there's a war for your worship. We talked about how your worship is uh, unavoidable. We all worship something. You can't run from it, but you can choose where you place it. We also talked about how your worship is a pathway. It's transactional. It comes with a price. Whatever you lean into, good or bad, you will reap a harvest from it. So what are you worshiping? We talked about worshiping status. Are you climbing the corporate ladder? Are you stepping on everybody that you can along the way? Are you worshiping self? Is it all about me, myself, and I? Are you worshiping money, the byproduct, which is greed and all kinds of other things? Or are you redirecting everything towards the creator, Genesis 127, the one who shaped and molded you in his, his image? In the last part we talked about, we talked about these three Hebrew men who were thrown in a fire by the madman Nebuchadnezzar. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, get thrown into a fire because they refused to worship a false God. They refused to fall into idol worship. And so they said, hey, we're going to throw you in this fire. And they said, you can, but our God will rescue us. But even if he doesn't, we will never bow. Those men recognized, number three, last week, that worship was their weapon. Worship was their weapon. I encourage you to go back and check it out on our YouTube channel. This week for week number two of DNA, I want to do a part two about worship and our response so our sermon title today, if you're taking down notes, which I encourage you to, is your worship is worth it. Your worship is worth it. Let's pray. God, give us ears to hear you. You've already been, your presence is here. We've already felt the significant move of your spirit. We know that we didn't just walk in for an experience. We didn't come in to play church. We came in for a deposit. Give us ears to hear you, a mind to understand, and most importantly, a heart ready to receive. If you receive it, say Amen. All right, we always have a foundation verse. This is our foundation verse, the anchor verse to week number two of DNA. It's found in James chapter one, verses two through four. I love how it starts. It's very encouraging. It says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. You're like, wow, my God, thank you. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, you're like, okay. Another, another translation talks about obstacles, situations, storms, because you know that the testing of your faith, say that out loud, testing of your faith produces perseverance. That's good. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. How many of y'all have ever been tested before? Come on. There's a guy in the back with two hands and a foot lifted. He's like, I'm being tested right now, brother. Now, how many of y'all have legitimately been tested? And it comes in different forms. The testing of your faith comes in so many different intricacies. It could be a, a health situation, a money crisis. It could be something that's just simple, that God spoke something and you're ready to go. And then there's this season of waiting and this season of wandering and asking God, like, did I really hear you? The testing of our faith. I remember when Jackie and I first got married, our daughter Finley's on the front row. She's 12. And I remember when we first got married, Brecken, who's 14, they were little. They were probably like five and six, maybe seven and eight. Uh, and I was saving. Man, we had been saving for a while. For those of you who want, uh, maybe you didn't know my background, I did music for a long time. I was uh, in the worship arts, creative, uh, wrote a lot of songs, traveled and did music, was a worship pastor for many years uh, before God uh, shifted the assignment to where we're at now. And so I, I, did, I did music for a long time. Uh, some of you are like, do you have any records? I'll Google it. Oh, <laughs> Okay. It's no big deal, guys. Okay, so anyways, I, I'd, been, I'd been saving money. I was so excited. And I said, babe, I've got the money. I've got the money to custom build my dream guitar. I mean, I had picked everything, the top, back, and sides, the pearl inlays. I mean, it was exactly like I wanted. Then I get a call from this company, and they said, hey, um, so-and-so, the founder of this company, he is only making a handful of guitars because he's literally retiring, but he himself is actually going to be one of the ones building your guitar. I said, my God, this is what favor looks like. <laughs> 
So I was excited. We'd saved the money. It was a done deal. And I remember when I got it and I opened it up. I mean, when I opened the case, it was like dry ice came out and I heard, ah, like it was this whole moment. I pulled the guitar out. And the moment I pulled the guitar out, I felt like the Holy Spirit checked me and said, you didn't build this for you. And I said, that's a, that's a lie of the devil. It's a familiar spirit. How many of all that's ever happened? The Lord's like, I need you to give this away. You're like, not today, devil. No, not today. You're not tricking me again. Amen. By the way, the devil will never ask you to be a blessing. But that's it for a minute. I want you to bless that person by their meal. Not today, devil. The Lord told me to be on a budget. I'm not blessing them. <laughs> no, no, listen. The devil is the accuser of the brethren. He is the author of lies. He will never ask you or entice you to be a blessing. So if God asks it, will you be obedient? So this is not yours. You didn't build this for you. I put the guitar away. I didn't tell Jackie about it because she would be like, what does that mean? What are we talking about right now? So just a few weeks later, I'm leading worship at this conference. I'm really excited to be there. A couple thousand people in the room, man. It feels like the Spirit of God is breathing in the room. It was an Acts 2 moment. I'm all excited, and I feel the Lord say, see the guy in the third row? I said, mm-hmm. And the Lord said, I, I, he feels overlooked, undervalued, and not seen by anybody, including me. I need you to call him out, and I need you to say that I see him and that you see him, and you're going to give your guitar to him. I said, mm-mm. Nope. Use Cody. He has a nice guitar. It's a nice guitar. Use him. So I was like, hey, man, what's your name? He's like, Troy. I said, Troy, I want you to know that God sees you. Not only does God see you, but I see you. You're not overlooked. You're not undervalued. You're appreciated. You're gifted. Would you come up on the stage? And while I'm saying it, I'm like, why are you doing this? I'm like, come on up on the stage. And my guitar was sitting on a stand. Y'all was being tested. It was right here. Just, and it was like the lights were hitting it a certain way, and it was glowing. Like, <laughs> it's blinding people in the room. They're like, it's so bright, because I'd schlock that thing up with pledge. So he walks up on the stage, and I'm like, no, 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 stay away from over there. Come over here. Because <laughs> I'm still searching my heart. Like, is this a familiar spirit or the Lord? You know, hey, amen. All right. So I said, what's your name? He said, Troy. I said, Troy, I want you to know, and I just felt like the Lord began to prophetically speak through me in this moment. In the room, people are crying. I'm like, I don't even know who this dude is. Like, he could be a visitor. I said, Troy, do you play an instrument? He said, I do. I play guitar. I was like, of course you do. <laughs> of course you do, Troy. You have calluses on your fingertips. I can see it. I said, uh, how long have you been playing? Like, are you, are you new? And he was like, I've been playing for 16 years. I'm like, oh, so you like play, play. Like, he's the guy that goes to Guitar Center and picks up the guitar and plays. And everybody's like, what? It's like a stairway to heaven and stuff. So I'm sitting there, and I'm like, okay, well, listen, man. I want you to know not only does God see you, but I see you. And the Lord wanted me. And I literally, I picked up the guitar, and I was shaking. And I tried to hand it to him. And when he tried to take the guitar, I wouldn't let go of it. You know, a lot of times you block the blessing in your life because you won't release what's in your hands. And if I would have held on to it, God, what God was planning and wanting to do through me in some other areas, if I would have said, we're hold this, hold this guitar, one day God will give you a guitar like that. <laughs> Amen. No, I said, listen, God sees you. Put it on. He put it on. Man, we prayed over him. It's so cool. You know the song that we uh, sing here, There is a Breaking? You know the song like, uh, how's it go? How's it go? That's terrible. There is a breaking. There is a shifting in the... I should know it because I co-wrote it with that guy and this other guy with that guitar. Come on, somebody. How cool is that? But I was being tested. And I was building something that wasn't for me, but what I didn't know was that God was already simultaneously speaking to someone else, and they were building a guitar that wasn't for them. So months and months. When I tell you months, the testing season, I was borrowing people's guitars. Like, hey, does that thing stay in tune? I need it. Because I told the Lord, I told Jackie, she said, you going to buy another guitar? I said, no. God made me give that away. He's going to pay it back. Amen. <laughs> Does seed time and harvest work? So I end up nine months later at this conference, and this guy calls me out. says, man, I feel like the Lord had spoken to me a long time ago, and we have custom built. And he pulls out this guitar. What he doesn't know is I shortchanged on the first one I built. There were certain woods and different things I wanted. Everything I had desired and prayed and asked God about, this guitar had it. And they blessed me with it and gave it to me. Amen. I learned a lot through those years, though, that everything good, everything that, that God has good for me and Jackie and our family, everything that he wants to unlock in and through me always comes after a testing of my faith moment. How many of y'all 
would agree that that is like you'll get direction without all the details, but then there's this test. So we're going to unpack that a little bit more today because there seems to be these fixed, both spiritually and in the natural moments that we all have to walk through, and there's this pattern. Jackie and I, the past almost 19 years of marriage, coming up in July, let's go. Hey, and I heard it was the barber's 18th anniversary today. Let's make some noise. Well done, Ken and Barbie. That's amazing. But Jackie and I almost, well, this, for the, almost the last 19 years of being married, we, we begin to recognize the pattern of God's blessings in our life. There's these tr- trusting moments. We hear from the Lord. We submit. We're obedient. And then there's this waiting season. And what we've agreed upon all 19 years, well, the first four years, maybe we didn't quite get it yet. But say the last 15 years, we've recognized that the waiting season doesn't have to be a wasted season. And in that testing season, that's where revelation That's where clarity, that's where so many good things are unlocked when we're in the testing season. But every single time, every single time we're in the testing and waiting season, it always comes back to one thing, trusting trusting God. It always comes back to will we trust him even when we can't track him? So as we're in our DNA series, we know that there are things that are fixed, that are unchanging, including Jesus himself. Hebrews 13, verse eight, I brought this verse out last week. It says, Jesus Christ is eternally changeless, always. The same yesterday, read it with me, today and forever. So the definition of DNA, if you're curious, up on the screens, the fundamental and distinctive characteristics or qualities of someone or something, especially when regarded as unchangeable. There are these patterns in the Bible that we know are fixed. They're spiritual laws, spiritual principles that are ancient and unchanging. Yet we try to bend and mold it into what we want, how we want, when we want. I've said this before, you can't microwave spiritual maturity. It comes with a daily discipline of being in the word and prayer and spending time in the presence of God. Driving to work, you pray, you talk to the Lord, spend a little bit of time in the mornings in the word and then simply remembering all that God has done. There are these patterns though in the Bible that we see that are fixed. One spiritual law that is unchanging has never changed, has never been wavering, is in Romans chapter six, verse 23. It says this, for the wages of sin is death. That's the decay of the mind, the body, and the soul. But thank God that the free gift, I love the second half, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Thank God for his grace and his mercy that when we repent and we go and sin no more, that when we repent and turn away, there's enough grace for every goof up. Come on, somebody. Mercy for every mistake. But this is a spiritual law that the wages of sin are death. That when we try to go our own way and we try to dictate the direction and we try to follow our own plans, I've said this before, you ever want to make God laugh? And God has a sense of humor. You can't convince me otherwise. You ever gone to the mall and just watch people? <laughs> like we're all created in his image, but you know God's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a little funny with this one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, that's not okay. <laughs> no, you ever want to make God laugh? Tell him your plans. Tell them your plans. God, I know that you're the creator of everything. You told the stars where to go and the water where to stop. You told the sun where to be. You told all that, but uh, like, I'm gonna go my way. I bet on me. Man, spiritual laws, spiritual principles, they're all around us. I wanna look at a spiritual principle this week in surrounding worship. If you're taking down notes, I want you to write this down. We need to, this is a choice, we need to offer, number one, trust as our worship. We need to offer our trust as our worship. Talked about this again last week, recapping like I did up top. There's a war for our worship. Satan wants it, but only God himself deserves it. You can enjoy all the good things in life. My friend Ebron sitting on the front row, he cooks a mean steak. Every time he puts it on Instagram, it's like scratch and sniff. I'm like, you should invite me over, amen. (laughs) There's things we can enjoy in life. There's good food and good friendships and the ocean and mountains. The one thing we're not supposed to touch is the glory. The one thing that we're not supposed to touch is the worship. That's the one thing that we should always redirect. I love what Brooke Frazier says. People will come up to her. She wrote the song, uh, Beautiful Name, and all these other songs like, you have no rival, you have no equal. What a powerful name it is. And people will walk up and say, Brooke, oh my God, what a beautiful song. You're amazing. 
And she said she used to not be able to take compliments. And the Lord said, it's okay, accept it like flowers. So she said she would accept it like roses, all the compliments. And at the end of every night, she said, I would get down on my knees before God and I would offer them back to him and say, these all belong to you anyways. Every breath I breathe belongs to you. When I worship you, I'm simply giving you your breath back. All the sneaker heads, I'd increase them. I'd increase them. Y'all notice the technique, up and down, amen. Amen. But we talked about last week how it's unavoidable. You can run from it, but we have a choice and an option of where we place our worship. It's in our DNA. It's embedded in us. Our patterns, our pathways. Worship is a weapon. So today we have to establish our foundation for week number two, what we will place our worship in. Watch this. The Bible describes God, the creator of all, as the author of life, all-powerful, uncreated, supremely creative, kind, long-suffering, gentle, resourced, generous, forgiving, gracious, and loving. Who wouldn't want to be in relationship with a God like this? Come on. People love the, oh, I love this, Daniel. I love that he's gentle and resourced. I love that he's my provider, my refuge, my strength. I love that he's my very present help in time of need. But what truly proves your a person's worship, what truly proves that you really, really, really worship him is not lip service on what you say. It's your trust. I've heard it, say, I've heard it said before by one of my fathers in the faith that trust is God's love language. So I'm gonna ask the question again, it's loaded. Do you really trust him? Do you really trust him? Because trust is simply our love response to the one who loves us, who created us, who, knew, who knows you by name. Do you really trust him? So the first one is trust. We offer to him our trust as our worship. Number two, another principle we're looking at today is we need to offer, this is, this is heavy, we need to offer sacrifice as our worship. Write that down, sacrifice as our worship. Sacrifice, it just feels heavy. Y'all, I'm sweating up here like Bishop Jakes. It's a hot, it's a hot day. Amen, okay. Sacrifice, it feels heavy. Another way to say it though is this is a testing season. How many of y'all feel like you're in a testing season? It's okay, how many of y'all feel like it? We're a crowd participation church, come on. A testing season. I've noticed it's a pattern in my life. God says, worship me. I'm gonna give you direction. Follow my commands. Be obedient. Now I'm gonna test you. <laughs> That's where we get weary. Our foundation verse, again, it's in this testing season. It's found in James 1, that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. My perseverance was tested this week. Uh, Jackie wanted to go to Ikea. She was like, you want to go to Ikea? I was like, I haven't had any Swedish meatballs with brambleberry sauce and furniture with impossible uh, instructions and a spike in my blood pressure in a while. So yeah, let's go. <laughs> and Ikea furniture is wild. It's like the, 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 the instructions are bizarre. And you're like, so I take this popsicle stick, this flex seal tape, these two little pieces of wood and that, and it's going to make a love seat? This is unbelievable. So instead of putting it together, we had our friend Isaac put it together. Give it up for Isaac. He's amazing. But when it comes to Ikea, I always like to put a little pressure. So we had this chair built. I like to put a little pressure on that chair or that couch before I sit in it. Why? Because I want to test it. Why? I need to make sure the integrity of the chair is secure so the longevity can be expected and experienced. God knows he is the answer from the beginning to the end. He knows what you need before you know it. He knows I need to help steward, shape, and mold her right now in this waiting season. So I'm going to test her faith a little bit. I'm going to put a little bit of pressure on her to see if she breaks. I've said this before. A rubber band is only valuable when it's stretched. A rubber band is useless sitting in a drawer somewhere. A rubber band has one purpose, to be stretched. And we in our humanity, the moment we're stretched, the moment we're tested, we're like, God, what are you doing? You told me to do this, and now you're going to break me? And he's like, no, 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 no. The stretching is not designed to break you. It's actually a slingshot going to launch you if you'll just stay obedient, and you'll stay consistent, and you'll stay focused on me. But it's amazing how in our humanity we deduce that our way is wiser <laughs> and that our plans are better. Proverbs 16, verse 9 says, in their hearts, humans, that's us. Look at the person next to you. He's talking about you. He's literally talking about you. In their hearts, humans play in their course. I got it. I know where I'm going. I'm going to do it. 
in my own strength because I'm gifted, I'm talented. Uh, but then it goes, but, but the Lord establishes their steps. That's why I said earlier, you wanna make the Lord laugh, tell him your plans. I remember right out of high school, I had my plans, man, everything. I had it charted out. There's nothing wrong with writing the vision out. I mean, I had it all planned out, but everything I had written down was the opposite of what my call was. Everything I had written out was not what God wanted, but because I didn't take time to spend time in his presence to hear his voice, I remember this wake-up call moment at this worship night where it was almost like the Lord leaned down and said, hey, you want to include me? Because the way I have and the stewardship that I have and what I want to shape and mold and take you towards and because it includes a, a wife and your kids, it includes purpose, it includes this assignment that's connected to all these people that will be healing in your hands. But no, no, I was, I was running my own my own path, I was blazing my own trail. And y'all, I love the hustle, I love the grind, but I'm telling you, when you sink your heart up in alignment with God, doors of favor will open the hustle and can't get you. God will open up doors, your names in rooms that you haven't even walked into yet. It's all a part of alignment. Isaiah chapter 55, verses nine to 11 says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. It's like, okay, God, I got it. And my thoughts than your thoughts. Like, okay, I'm getting it. Verse 10, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, they do not return to it without watering the earth, making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. Verse 11, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Jeremiah 29, 11, he has plans for you, plans to prosper you with a hope and a future, not of destruction and chaos. I was talking to a guy in the lobby in between services, and I was telling him, I said, here's the reality, man. Life gets uncomfortable. We deal with some things. I don't understand. I haven't received or experienced his blessings in a long time. The truth is God wants to pour out his spirit and his blessings on all of us. You can't stop his blessings, but you can block them. That's where free will gets in the way. Like we're up here singing, bless me, bless me, Kirk Franklin songs. But really, the Lord's like, test me, test me. I'm gonna test you. Because if he can't trust what he wants to pour out, can he trust you with what he wants you to be a good steward of? Will you block the blessing by getting in the way of it? All right, I'm gonna leave that one alone. That's like a fall series. We'll jump back in. Y'all, as I was reading this, his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. I wrote in my notes, he is worthy to be praised and also worthy to be followed. He's worthy to be followed. So God, I'll follow your plans as long as it fits in my box of ideas that make me super comfortable. Lord, I trust you, but when you say, or he says, listen, uh, I know the direction I wanna take you if you'll follow my plans like a GPS and, and where it says to, how, how many of y'all have ever overridden your GPS because you got a little bit of control issues? Even when it's a solid bar of red, you're like, Psh, I know better. Yeah, you're stopped. <laughs> like, it becomes a parking lot. Okay, same thing with the presence of God. He's saying, listen, I'm gonna lead and direct your steps. I need you to go this way. And you're like, ah, that road's not very comfortable. I'm gonna, and then you end up here. I love what Tim Ross says. He said, God is not, he's not concerned about a massive leap of faith where you have to jump over here and say, okay, God, did you see my leap of faith? Like, will you bless me now? He said, he's more concerned with your little step of obedience. At least you're taking a step listening to where he's leading you, not trying to take your own path. The truth is when we get uncomfortable, the truth is when we want God to do it in our own mind set, in our own thoughts and our own ideas, this is where we often go our own way. This is where we tend to fall short. Why? This is the line. Write this down. Because sacrifice costs us something. The testing season oftentimes is filled with sacrifice, and it costs you something. Every time God asks Jackie and I to believe for something with great faith and boldness, it always costs us something. Following God, pursuing the gospel, y'all, it's serious business. It's serious business. Read about the disciples. I talked about my friend last week, Ingolf Schmidt, and the persecution that he's received with all their underground churches and what they're doing because they've been threatened with prison or even 
even death, sacrifice costs you something. And oftentimes it'll cost you your pride. Oftentimes this cost, it costs you your control. Oftentimes when you yield to the presence of God, it costs you your bragging rights. I said it earlier, like, nah, I bet on me. Whenever you bet on you and you don't lean into the presence of God, oftentimes it leads to broken moments in your life. That's why we say here at Hope City, the answer begins with and ends with Jesus because his way is better every single time. If you believe it, say amen. Come on. So you might be asking me today, uh, okay, so how, how do I know and how do I know what or who I serve? Easy, what are you sacrificing or how do I know what I'm sacrificing for or to? Because whatever you offer sacrifices to, you ultimately end up serving. Whatever you bend to, you end up a slave to. Whatever you can't talk about will own you. So let me, let me post some scenarios. Maybe you've been sacrificing sleep for a late night habit or addiction. It's costing you. Maybe you've been sacrificing time with your kids to climb the corporate ladder. Maybe you've placed the grind and the hustle of work in front of everyone and everything. Maybe you've been skipping out on generosity or your tithe to support an unbalanced social life. So what ends up happening is when these things get out of order in your life, they become idols you serve. They become lust and success and self. and Ultimately, they end up robbing you. It costs you something. It's more than you think. There's this old saying, sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, cost you way more than you want to spend. How many of y'all have experienced that before? Come on, wave at me. It's okay. Some of y'all are like, you're stepping on our toes again. I thought this was supposed to be fun, fun stories. <laughs> but through surrender, God is asking us, I'm telling y'all to lay these things down. Whatever's holding you back, we have a choice to repent and turn away because the verse, the principle, the spiritual law, wages of sin is death. It can rob you of your influence. It can rob you of your assignment. It can rob you of who God has asked you to become. Thank God for his grace and his mercy, though that he's still just one mention of his name away from being right there. No matter where you've been and what you've done, you're not too far gone. That's a good, elbow the person next to you and say, you're not too far gone. Come on, let them know. The great news is this, the sacrifices God asks for always work for our good. So let's talk about one word that we don't like, accountability. Because we think accountability is spiritual abuse. We don't like to talk about it, like don't keep me accountable, don't, don't tell me things that are going to make me better or help me grow. I remember my first pastor, he talked about John 15, five, and he talked about pruning. He said, uh, do you like this plant right here? And I said, I'm not really into plants. He's like, just, just track with me, okay, just track with me. I was like, I'm not a real big fan of plants. He's like, that's cool, just come on, just track with me for a minute. He was like, uh, my wife comes in like every two, three weeks and she trims that. You know why? I said, why? Because he said, that thing, if it's not trimmed, will grow out of control. It'll be like Jumanji in here. I won't be able to find my laptop by the end of the week. <laughs> and I laughed and he said, no, it's true. Pruning is important. We have to have accountability because pruning should be a priority. I have people in my life that pour into me. I have people in my life that are standing with me. And I have people in my life that I'm pouring into. But the people that are pouring into my life, I have people right now, I had a guy, one, one, one of our spiritual oversights called me last week and said, hey, bro, how are you? I said, good. He said, I saw you preached fire last week. I said, good, yeah, yeah, praise God, thanks. He said, you preaching again this week? I said, yeah. He said, what about the third week? I said, Jackie, he said, good, because you look a little tired. And I didn't say, you look tired. Because <laughs> that's humanity's response. Like, you don't know me. We're not even on Zoom. How do you see me? No, no, he just said, hey, it's important that you pace yourself. This is a marathon. You're gonna be leading thousands of people for many, many years. How are you and Jackie? I said, good. He said, cool, because I'll call her next. I said, no, we're real good. <laughs> we're real, real good. She's a little upset at me for talking about trash can dilemmas last week, but it's no big deal. How's your kids? Real good. I'm gonna call them. No, they're real good, I promise. Went right out and turned on. A, I was like, we're gonna swim today, kids. Where everything's good. You want popsicles? You maybe get a phone call. <laughs> Everything's good. <laughs> no, accountability is important because pruning has to be a priority. Accountability, it might be uncomfortable to invite someone in your space to help check you and keep you on track. 
because it's important for continue, continued growth in your life. Okay, speaking of accountability, I, was, I don't know this, dear brother, but uh, you can tell when somebody like really put a lot into like their look. And uh, I was at the rodeo last week. This guy wa- was walking by me and I noticed something about him that he didn't notice about himself. And I was watching everybody laughing at him, nobody talking to him. And I was like, he doesn't know. He, he doesn't know. <laughs> so I walk over. I mean, like, he's got these, like, I don't, I don't, these boots, I don't know anything about boots. They were anywhere between $100 and $6,000. I don't know. They were like, he could have got them a DSW or a custom boot shop. I don't know. They were amazing. So I'm like, bro, your boots are amazing. And he's, he looks down and he goes, thanks, man. I mean, he smelled like Tim McGraw cologne. Like, he was together. A belt buckle. He was like, hey. <laughs> fancy hat. I mean, I'm like, bro. He was on a date. Like, you could just tell. Like, he's like, that's my cowgirl over there. And I was like, I said, hey, real quick. I put my hand on his shoulder, and I stepped down. What he didn't know was he was dragging about five feet of toilet paper connected to his boot. So he's walking along, like, bang, 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 bang. and people are like, ah, but nobody had enough kindness to say something to him. So I stepped on. I said, no big deal, bro. And he walked off. I was like, <laughs> and then I walked away, and it stayed stuck to me, and I didn't know it. So I'm walking around just, and a guy walks up to me. He's like, hey, dude, you're dragging that. I was like, come on. It's amazing, though, when you're not routing your worship in the right places. A lot of times you'll carry things that you don't even notice. You're all dressed up. You look like you have it all together, but you're dragging around things that don't belong to you because things have been out of order. That's why accountability is so important. Blind spots are called blind spots for a reason because you can't see them. You need people in your life to say, hey, hey, real quick, did you, do you know that you've been like over the top sarcastic lately? I didn't notice. Do you, do you recognize that you're late to everything? You don't show up on time for anything? You don't respect anybody's time? I didn't notice I was late. I just, <laughs> you notice that you always wait for me to pay for all of it? You're like, you just can't find, you've got the T-Rex arms, you're like, I can't. Find my wallet. That's so weird. Now you need to have accountability in your life. You need to have people in your life that will check you. That actually, But here's the key. Not only do you have people in your life that will check you and speak in your life, but you'll actually allow them to. I have a, I don't know, I can't get away from it. I cleaned carpets for my dad's water damage carpet cleaning company all throughout high school. So junior high, high school, it's how I paid my way through Bible college and and I just, I enjoyed it. I mean, we would go uh, and have father-son time. It was great. Post, post him giving his life to Jesus, post Jesus, my dad was just one of the best, still is one of the best men on the planet. And uh, I remember spending time with him. And, but I have always now focused on, I would walk into a building and I look at the carpet all, every time. So even walking through here or walking into somebody's house, I'll be like, ooh, we probably should get this carpet cleaned. They're like, I didn't even notice. I'm like, are you sure a dead, somebody might have died right there. Like, this is bad. So I notice it, right? I'm always looking down. So when people come to our house, when we invite you, don't just, show, don't just show up. Don't you just show up. But when we invite you, Jackie will warn me on our way. We slow walk and she's like, hey, hey, look at me. Hey, give them 30 seconds for you lean down and start untying their shoe. Because I'll be like, hey, how are you? Good to see you. Let me get these for you. And just put them off to the side because I don't want you dragging Golden Corral into my house or wherever you've been that day. Somebody will walk in, even my own daughter. She's a sneakerhead like me, but my daughter, Finley, uh, every once in a while, because she's a kid, will get into something. I'll be like, babe, you have mud all over your shoes. And she's like, what? I didn't even notice. A lot of times people will notice accountability. Relationships in your life will notice something on you before you notice it. That's why accountability is important. Man, I've been on this for a minute. I'm going to leave this alone. Some of y'all are looking at me like you're mad. Like, when's Jackie going to preach? Okay. <laughs> so how do we know that we're walking out a season it's being tested. How do we know what it looks like? Like, am I in a tested season? For me, I always go back to the Bible. That is our foundation. That's the manual. So we go, we go and look at heroes of the old whose obedience was shown and their faith was proven. I'm gonna look at five individuals really quickly. Noah, for example, he lived in a godless culture, much uh, similar to the day and age we're in now. So much so, though, in the Old Testament covenant sort of time frame, God regretted making mankind. Like, that's a pretty intense statement. Noah was found to be a man, though, of character and integrity. And by following God, he continued to follow God, which required him to be placed in the center of public mocking and scrutiny. But considering God to be worth following, he focused on the mission ahead, 
even though God's design and direction he gave him was crazy. I love my boy Mike Todd. He says, it's only crazy until it happens. But Noah had a word and a promise from the Lord, and he stayed with it. Even in the testing season, Noah, will you build this ark? Uh, sure. It's a huge boat on dry land. Okay. Rain's going to come. I don't know what that is. They couldn't Google it back then. Rain had never fallen from the sky. The earth was watered from the ground up. So this guy looks like a madman building a boat for something they've never heard of. And then he was tested in his obedience. Then there was Abraham, who was described as a great man of faith. God had amazing things for his life, but they seemed far from realistic. Abraham vocalized his worship. He said, God, I'll be obedient, but was tested in his obedience to God's plan. Then you look at Joseph. Joseph's another one. You can read about his life in Genesis chapter 37 through Genesis 50. Joseph received a vision from God. I've got the vision. He submitted to God, and then he entered into what would have been one of the most difficult seasons of unrest for him. We all love talking about David. Preachers preach about David all the time. He's a man after God's heart. Like, we love David. When David was young, he loved and feared God. He was faithful in the small things. And then he was anointed at a young age by the prophet Samuel to be the king over all of Israel. The moment he was promoted and was anointed, he saw some of the most difficult testing in that time. Because here's the reality. Anytime God speaks a promise over you, you'll leave a night of worship. How many of y'all, you, you can speak to this. You'll leave a night of worship filled up. Immediately, the enemy tries to come in and steal that seed. Immediately, the enemy tries to come in because he is the deceiver. He's the accuser of the brethren. He did it to Eve in Genesis. Did God really say? Did God really tell you to start that business? Did God really tell you to do this? Did God really tell you to give that away? I mean, was, is it, does it fit in the Dave Ramsey plan? Like, that's, no, but the enemy tried to rob David of what was placed on him. He was anointed but what we saw with David is he began to develop character and he really started trusting God and his leadership was developed in the testing season. Then you look at the life of Mary who was approached by God with a supernatural prophecy. She hid what was in her heart and in the joy of her anointing, she was still faced with a season of displacement in, in Egypt and although God entrusted Jesus to her, she's carrying around both God and man in her womb there were steps of obedience that needed to be followed to serve God's plan of redemption. So we see through their stories and even ours that we can relate to, we have to trust, say trust. Then there's obedience, sacrifice in the testing seasons. I said it a moment ago, following God and serving God is serious business. We can't confess he is Lord, but not follow where he leads. That's why I said it last week, the surrender isn't a one-time event. It's a daily discipline. Psalms 23 says that he leads. What does it say? He leads me by still waters to restore and rest and rejuvenate my soul. He leads. We have to relinquish control and allow him to lead. Write this down. It's going to step on somebody's J's. Sometimes God has to ruin your plans so your plans don't ruin you. Sometimes God has to mess up your plans that you don't mess your entire assignment over. But his plans don't end there unless you do. His promises are yes and amen, so don't bow out. Stay the course, stay on mission, because at the end of the testing, this is the good news, comes the promise. So the first one is we offer our trust as worship. We offer our sacrifice, number two, as worship. And number three, if you're writing this down, number three influences our inheritance. This is the promise influences our inheritance. The promises of God don't have expiration dates on them. When you lean on the promises of God in the testing season, they don't break when you lean on them. Watch how God, though, unlocks influence as an inheritance in our Hall of Faith crew that we were just talking about a moment ago. Noah, he was given a difficult task, mocked, followed when it didn't make sense. And in his obedience, God delivered him and his family from a wicked world, then entrusted him to establish a new era. Abraham tested, discouraged, even confused, and then established God, establishes him in the testing season as the father of many nations in the midst of all his physical improbabilities. Joseph endured hardship, 
the hardship of prison and the pain of false accusation, but God delivered him from captivity so that God could use Joseph to save his people. David fled for his, his life, displaced from his homeland, then ultimately established as king over all of Israel, ultimately walked in the favor of the Lord and is the only man in the Bible that was called a man after God's heart. And then you look at Jesus' mother Mary, fled from her home, watched her son be crucified. Y'all think about that. As parents, if a kid, one of your kids get hurt, you feel it deep in your Deep in your bones, you feel it. Mary had to watch her own son be crucified. But through it all, she encountered the joy of the resurrection of our long-awaited Messiah, who we serve now, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's this pattern, not only in the natural, but the spiritual realm, but in every great man or woman in life that God wants to place an anointing or his salvation on, a testing of your integrity, ultimately it comes with a promise of multiplication. So again, as believers, we say Jesus is Lord, but is he truly the Lord if you stop trusting him as soon as you can't track him? Is he really your Lord? I've said this before, and this is kind of a harsh, loaded statement, but if he's not the Lord of everything, then he's not the Lord of anything. Have you yielded and leaned your life in? Because we can't let a mindset creep in that says Jesus is the Lord of my life, so now I can do whatever I want. I've already committed my life to Jesus. Now I can live however I want, and God will still bless me. Write this down. If God is gonna bless us, he's most likely going to test us. If God's gonna bless you, he's most likely gonna test you, but your testing is not just for you. When we look at the heroes of the Bible, we see a principle, a specific principle at work, that righteousness leads to more righteousness. It's a domino effect. My dad gives his life to the Lord. My brother, my sister, and I walk with the Lord. Now my kids will be raised up and given an opportunity to walk with the Lord. Righteousness leads to righteousness. With everyone we talk today, I love how they all, in a domino effect, are connected together. Jesus was in the line of Mary. Mary was in the line of David. David was in the line of Joseph. Joseph was in the line of Abraham, and Abraham was in the line of Noah. When you choose to trust God, God will rule and reign and navigate your children, your descendants, and your children's children. That's a good word. Psalms 37, 25 says, I've been young and now I'm old. Yet I've not seen the righteous, that's us, those in right standing with God, abandoned or his descendants pleading for bread. That was a promise for me in my personal life when my father chose to give his life to the, to the Lord. He opened the gates for me to choose Jesus. And now that righteousness that leads to righteousness, that domino effect now opened the door for my kids to choose Jesus. Would you close your eyes just for a moment across every campus? I wanna encourage some parents in the room specifically. I wanna speak something over you prophetically. I wanna speak a blessing over you that in Jesus' name, your endurance will be worth it. Come on, claim that. The days you prioritize church and your faith the nights you prioritize your kids' spiritual growth, maybe by taking them to a youth group, the consistency of family prayer around the dinner table and the guarding of what you allow in your home, single mama, or dad raising these babies on your own, or a family that may be broken, that you're believing God for it to not fall apart but fall into place. God, I pray today that the prioritized moments of faith, God, I pray that they won't return on callous ground or broken ground, but good seeds have been planted. And I wanna speak this over every mom and dad today. You will reap what you sow and it will be a harvest of righteousness in Jesus' name. And maybe you're listening right now and you'd say, Daniel, that was heavy. The truth is, I haven't been great at this. There hasn't been a spiritual priority. Trust hasn't been a, a, a priority of worship in my house. Sacrifice hasn't been a priority in my house. I've got great news. You can start today. Thank you, Lord, that you make up for missed moments and lost time. I thank you that there's an invitation open for all of us to set a new pace. With every eye closed just for a moment. Maybe you're here and you'd say, Daniel, man, this message was a little convicting because I'm not trusting him like I need to. Or I've been really quick to give up if I can't track him. Yeah, I've got some control issues. I've struggled like I do with a GPS to follow him when he tells me to go away. Or maybe I've gotten so caught up in myself that I've just ignored it. 
today's the day that I wanna, I wanna lean back in. I wanna, I wanna trust him again. I, I feel like I'm in a perpetual testing season and I really believe after hearing this word today that God's not trying to get something from me. He's trying to get something to me. And that deposit he wants to get to me is kind of hitting some hard, calloused ground. And I realize the testing is for my good. And ultimately, I want to inherit the promises and I want to walk out the influence and the assignment he's called me to. With every eye closed, Woodlands, Katie here at West Houston, you say, Daniel, today I've been struggling with trust. I've been struggling with allowing the testing season and I haven't been walking out the promises of God. Would you just lift up one hand and say, you're talking about me today. You're talking about me. I see your hands. You're talking about me today. I've been struggling in this area. I'm struggling to really trust him. My money's funny. My situation is bleak. My health is, feels like it's in decline. My family feels like it's in trouble. I'm struggling to trust today. God, I pray that you would meet them all right where they're at right now. You can put your hands down. I've been struggling. I've been in the testing season, but I bail every time I'm tested because the rubber band stretching is super uncomfortable. And I've realized today, <laughs> the stretching is for my good because the stretching is actually to add more to my arsenal, to give me and equip me with more tools for what I'm gonna need in the future. I've been struggling in the testing, but today I'm gonna lean into it. Would you stand to your feet, everybody in the room? Too many of us, we embrace and love God's attributes, but we hate God's testing. I wanna encourage you today, don't skip out on the test. Don't skip out on the test. Would you lift your hands open-handed with your eyes closed just for a moment? We're gonna dive back into worship for just a moment. It's the way we've been ending out every service since the beginning of the year, and I wanna keep it. I wanna keep it going. Maybe you're here today and say, Dan, I'm having a tough time. Daniel, I'm having a tough time even worshiping because I feel like the chapter I'm in is never ending. I've got great news for you. It's just a chapter. It's not the whole season. The storm will pass. Eventually, eventually the storm will run out of rain the power of God's presence is gonna meet you where you're at right now and minister to you right now. Moms, dads, daughters, sons, brothers, and sisters, God, I thank you for the power of your spirit that overshadows us with peace right now. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together word, all together Come on, with our hands lifted, our voices raised, say, here I am. Here I am to, here I am to bow down. Here I am to say, you're my God. You're all together, all together, all together. Wonderful to me. Say, here I am to Here I am to bow down. You're my God. Lovely. All together worthy. Wonderful. And you are worthy of it all. For from you, for from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Come on, every voice from the back to the front say, You were the of it Just the voices and the drums across every campus watching online say, You are worthy of it all. Come on, even if you can't sing on key, say, You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, for from you are all things. 
You can put your hands down just for a moment if you're here today and you would say, Daniel, here's the truth. I'm struggling with trust. I'm struggling with surrender. I'm struggling with all of it because I don't know Jesus as my Savior, but today I want to. Something in my heart has been stirring this entire service that there's more to life than the way I've been living it. And today I want to give my life to Jesus for the very first time here at Hope City. We don't pray prayers for symbolic reasons. We pray according to Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. This says, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. Slate wiped clean. Sin's thrown as far from the east as the west. Maybe you're the second invitation. You say, Daniel, here's the truth. I'm struggling with trust because I ran in the testing season and I got caught up in the prodigal life and I have been living reckless. But today's the day, March 12, 2023, that I want to rededicate my life officially. I want to come home today. With every eye closed, when I hit three, I promise we won't embarrass you. I want you to boldly lift up your hand. We saw 110 people last week commit their lives to Jesus across all of our campuses in a moment just like this. The reason we do all of this is because people matter to God. You matter to God, so you matter to us. So as we close out today, one, I want to give my life to Jesus for the first time. Two, I want to rededicate my life. Three, if that's you, would you lift up your hand? I'm looking all over the room. I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you, 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 you. I see you here and here and here. I see you here, I see you here. I see you in the back. Come on, Hope City, can we give God praise? I see y'all. I see you over here, amazing. I see you, my friend. All right, I want everybody to pray this prayer. So to, to those that lifted their hand, or maybe you didn't lift your hand. Maybe you felt uncomfortable. The good news is God sees your heart. He didn't need to see your hand. Let's pray this prayer together. Say, Jesus, it's me. I've been living for me, and it hasn't worked. From today on, I choose to live for you. Thank you for hanging on that cross for me. Even though I didn't deserve it, you did it because you said I was worth it. Then on the third day, you got up out of the grave so that I could walk in freedom and life more abundantly. From this moment on, I align my life in a posture of surrender. You are my Father. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go, Hope City. Make some noise.